Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Here's a statement from the department of, duh. Rock and roll is built on the electric guitar. Okay, well, mostly. And not really in the beginning. In fact, the electric guitar, as we know it, didn't have much to do with the birth of rock and roll at all. The earliest rock evolved out of rhythm and blues combos. By the early 1950s, many of them featured some kind of electric guitar, but the honk and rhythm came from saxophones and pianos, which were pounded into matchsticks. The piano contributed bits of jazz, boogie-woogie, barrel house, and juke joint energy. And even through the 1950s, the construct known as the guitar hero was largely absent from the world of rock and roll, outside of Chuck Berry, of course. Instead, the early pioneers were piano heroes. Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis, Fats Domino, Ray Charles, Huey Piano Smith. But when guitars got louder, started sounding dirtier, and began to wail more powerfully, the number of rock and roll piano heroes were outgunned and began to recede into the background. Not entirely, though. Again, I'm talking just about pianos, none of this fancy synthesizer stuff. We do have Elton John and Billy Joel and Carol King. They all had massive careers based largely on piano songs. The Beatles, especially Paul McCartney, served the cause. Freddie Mercury of Queen wrote much of their greatest songs on piano. And there are others, Leon Russell, Mike Garson, who played with Bowie for years, Chuck Liddell, a favor of the Rolling Stones, Dr. John, Billy Preston, Stevie Wonder, Ray Manzarek of The Doors, Rick Wakeman of Yes, Keith Emerson of Emerson, Lake and Palmer. But you notice what's missing from that list? Any piano heroes from the world of alt-rock? Does even such a thing exist? Well, actually, yes. They're a bit hard to spot, but they're out there. Let me show you. This is the Ongoing History of New Music Podcast with Alan Cross. Welcome again. I'm Alan Cross, and we have spent so much time over the three decades of this program looking at guitar heroes, but we have never, ever touched on the original type of hero from the earliest days of rock, the people who made this music by pounding on a piano. The guitar hero has been glamorized countless times. Drummers are worshipped, bass players of their own subset of fame. And so do people who program keyboards and electronics. But for this show, I want to focus on alt-rock stars who are primarily famous for playing the ivories. So, piano heroes, in other words. First, though, a bit of piano history. For many, many decades, pianos were expensive, bespoke instruments that were out of reach for most people. But by the middle 1800s, the Industrial Revolution had made mass production possible, and one of the items made for the masses was the piano. It became fashionable for everyone to have a piano in their home. Now, keep in mind that this was before radio and before any sort of recorded music, so the only way you could summon music on demand in your home was to have someone perform it, often on a piano. The piano craze spurred the development of a professional songwriting class whose job it was to come up with music that people could play in their homes. These were the first pop music ditties that were sold on sheet music and arranged specifically for the piano. This combination of cheap instruments and a plentiful supply of new music to play established the piano as the musical instrument of the people in the years before World War I. Others took the piano in a different direction, especially in and around New Orleans, where a new form of music was born. They called it jazz. And along with having a completely different sort of groove, jazz also helped precipitate the great time signature shift. Let me explain that. Up until the early 1900s, the beat of a song really wasn't that much of a big deal. I mean, classical music didn't follow a beat. Folk music was more about melody and lyrics. And hymns and religious music weren't exactly dance floor favorites. The most common time signature was three-quarter time, waltz time, followed by the two-four time of marching music, which was a really, really big deal until sometime after 1900. But with the rise of the piano and the spread of jazz, especially an early form called ragtime, which was among the first new musical forms to use the left hand and the lower notes to supply a steady rhythm to what the right hand was playing, time signatures fell into four-four time 
the standard beat for most of today's popular songs. Other time signatures were basically left in the dust. 4-4 was the beat of the 20th century. Because it seemed that everyone had a piano, it became an essential instrument, not only in homes, but in music halls and movie theaters and bars and restaurants and juke joints and even brothels. And it was on the piano that much of popular music evolved. During World War II, the big dance bands of the era were stripped of their members as many were drafted. Maintaining a group of 10 or 12 or more members became too expensive. And the big bands gave way to smaller combos of three, four, or five players. In the 1940s, a form of jazz based on the abilities of the combo called the bebop developed. And such groups often had a piano player. Meanwhile, another form of music dubbed rhythm and blues coalesced, featuring players from the music halls and saloons and bars and juke joints and brothels. And it was these combos who helped create the combinations of what would become rock and roll. And from there, it's just a short step to the pioneers that we spoke about, Little Richard and Jerry Lee Lewis and Chubby Checker and so on. And while the piano helped create rock and roll, it was soon largely supplanted by the electric guitar. But it is still a vital instrument for writing and performing in all areas of popular music. Okay, with all that out of the way, we can start talking about some alt-rock piano heroes. And we're going to begin with a couple of women. First up, Kate Bush, one of the greatest alt-rock piano players of all time. Starting at the piano at age 11, she taught herself, she was discovered by Pink Floyd's David Gilmore when she was 15. He was a family friend. And by this time, Kate could also play the violin and the organ. She also started writing her own songs. A demo of 50 tracks made the rounds, and she was eventually signed by EMI. Coincidentally, Pink Floyd's label. Another 200 demos followed. And in August 1977, she started working on her first album. Within months... Kate was one of the best-known female singers in all of the UK. Over the years, fans were able to pick out the various influences in Kate's style. Classical, for sure, but there was also some glam rock in there, folk music, and also bits of wide-ranging ethnic music. Tori Amos was a prodigy who took to the piano when she was really, really young. While her older brother took lessons, Tori really didn't seem to need them. When she was two, she started plunking notes on the piano, even forming melodies that she'd heard once. By age three, she was writing her own songs. By age five, she was given a full scholarship to the Peabody Institute at John Hopkins University in Baltimore. Again, she was five, and that made her the youngest recipient of a scholarship from that school ever. Tori may have had something of a neurological advantage, because for as long as she can remember, music appeared to her as structures of light, which is a condition known as chromesthesia. This helped her play, because in addition to the sounds of the notes, she could just follow the colors. Tori studied classical music at the Peabody until she was 11. But then a problem Tori discovered rock, Zeppelin, Jimi Hendrix, and so on. And she became subordinate. Her scholarship was revoked, and she was asked to leave. But she kept playing. Her father, a Methodist minister, found her some gigs in both piano bars and, um, get this, gay bars. Tori won some talent contests, almost provided the Baltimore Orioles with a theme song, and played more piano bars. There was a detour into a rock band called Why Can't Tori Read, which had a deal with Atlantic Records. You can find their songs online, but that really didn't work. But because she had a contractual obligation to deliver six more albums under that deal, she went solo. It took a while for the first album to be polished to the level it needed to be. But when it did come out, wow. A couple of things about Tori's piano playing. She will only play a Bossendorfer, pianos that have been made in Austria since 1828. Not people go on stage with a full proper grand like she does. Tori considers her Bossendorfer to be female. She's always referring to her piano as a she. No name, just she or this lovely little lady. And watching her play is a treat too. 
I ran across an academic article entitled Piano Sexual, Fascinations of Tori Amos's Sexualized Virtuosity in Performance. And this article dissects things over eight pages with phrases like this. Let me quote. Amos's pianistic virtuosity and technical facility alongside her sexualized physicality and performance separate her from most women singer-songwriters who play the piano. She performs with a sexualized athleticism akin to the virtuosic fascinations literary theorist Hans Ulrich Gumbrecht describes in Praise of Athletic Beauty. She straddles the piano chair and twists her body to face the audience. By sitting at the piano with her legs wide open to direct not only her voice, but her genitals at the audience, she violates the protocols of basic girliness that demand closed legs. Again, this is an academic paper. At the same time, this arresting style works against the classical tradition in which she received her first training, a tradition that her experiments with piano styles and harpsichord playing suggest she has not abandoned. Wow. Let's move on to Fiona Apple. Like Tori Amos, she was composing her own songs at an early age, eight in her case. She had this knack of being able to take chord charts for guitars and turn them into sheet music for the piano. There's actually a clip of her on YouTube playing a keyboard as a small child. That's my song that I made up. Play it again. composition, right? She studied classical music, but eventually discovered jazz through the music of Ella Fitzgerald and Billie Holiday. Fiona would sit at the piano playing along. Her style became a mashup of classical, jazz, and pop. She started making demo recordings and eventually passed a cassette to the babysitter of a music publicist. That publicist then passed it on to Sony Music, and by the time Fiona was 20, she had a major label deal. Her first album was called Tidal, and it came with this big video hit. Around the same time the world was learning about Fiona Apple, another future piano hero appeared in the form of Ben Folds. The best thing that ever happened to Ben was when his father brought home a piano. He was a carpenter with a customer who couldn't pay for a job, so he was paid with a piano. This was perfect for nine-year-old Ben because he'd become a fan of Elton John and Billy Joel and began learning songs off the radio. But then he got a scholarship to a music school in Miami for percussion, which started off promising, but then he crashed out and lost his scholarship. He went back to the piano and spent, he says, six months running scales with a metronome like a freak. From there, it was a lot of dead ends and bands and gigs that went nowhere. It wasn't until he moved back home to North Carolina and formed a band he called Ben Folds Five that things started to click. He called his music punk rock for sissies. This is from the second Ben Folds Five record entitled Whatever and Ever Amen. It's the battle of who could care less. And you think Robert Files is cool But there are some things that you would change if it were a platinum album, Ben Folds 5, 1997. Since then, Ben Folds has released a number of albums on his own, collaborated with everyone from William Shatner to Weird Al, written soundtracks for Hollywood films, done some acting, appeared as a judge on an NBC talent show, served as an artistic director to a symphony orchestra, hosted a podcast, and written a memoir. And apropos of nothing, he's been married five times and divorced four, so... Ben folds five marriages. Sorry about that. Who else from the world of alt-rock bases their music around the piano? Stick around and find out. This program is something different. It's a look at piano heroes from the world of alt-rock. There aren't many of them, but those who do exist have added a lot of color to this music. 
The most commercially successful piano-based band to come out of the alt-rock world is arguably Coldplay. The piano is, after all, Chris Martin's primary instrument, and that's why many of the band's big songs involve the piano. He grew up listening to a lot of U2, AHA, the Norwegian band, and Michael Jackson, thanks to his dad, who was also a big music fan. At age 11, he was sent off to boarding school, where he had a teacher named Mark Tanner. Tanner was a professional concert pianist who also had an appreciation for pop and rock. It was through him that Chris discovered the piano. He seemed to have something of a facility with it, so his parents bought him his own keyboard. Throughout school, he was in and out of a variety of bands. The big break came when he entered University College London, where he met Coldplay bandmates Johnny Buckland, Guy Berryman, and Will Champion. The people that I've talked to say that Chris is an excellent pianist, not necessarily technically, although he is quite good, but certainly for his creativity and his ear for melody. He can't read music, believe it or not, but what he does with a piano is quite extraordinary. Maybe this is the reason. He's ambidextrous. While he writes with his left hand, he draws with his right. If your brain works this way, it kind of makes sense that when you sit down at a piano, things are going to come out differently. Next on our list of piano heroes has to be Tim Rice Oxley, the guy who supplies the keyboards in Keen. Keen came out of the same era as Coldplay and also stood out because of how the piano, not the guitar, figured into their sound. Tim took piano lessons as a teenager, but grew tired of all the classical material he had to play. So he stopped with the lessons and started listening to a lot of Beatles records, and that's where most of his style developed. Keen was formed in 1995 and had a guitar player for the first five years or so, but when that guy left, there was, as Tim put it, a big hole in our sound. He'd been the bass player until that point, and although he wanted to play the piano, he really didn't want to use anything digital. But when the guitarist left, there was an opportunity to change things up. He acquired a Yamaha CP70BM, a hybrid acoustic electric grand piano, after reading that the Beatles producer George Martin really liked this thing. He eventually tracked down a used one, and here's a quote. As soon as we plugged it in, it made this massive sound and we immediately knew it was the sound of Keen. It opened up everything for the band, which started having alt-rock hits like this. I came across a fallen tree I felt the branches of you looking at me Is this the place we used Coming up, two more piano heroes, including a one-hit wonder that really isn't. You'll see. The world of rock is filled with guitar heroes. This time, though, we're looking at alt-rock stars who have become famous via the piano. The next guy really only had one hit, but he was able to parlay that into something much more long-term. Greg Alexander was a Jehovah's Witness kid raised near Detroit. By the time he was 12, he taught himself to play the piano and started writing songs with his sister. By 16, he had his first major label recording contract, which was nice, but nothing happened. In 1997, he formed a band he called the New Radicals. And uh, band is a bit of a misnomer since he really was the only permanent member, along with a collaborator named Daniel Brisbois. They released an album called Maybe You've Been Brainwashed Too in the fall of 1998. And this piano-based single became one of the great one-hit wonders of the late 90s. Not just a one-hit wonder from the alt-rock world, but a piano-based one-hit wonder, period. If that's the case, why is Greg Alexander on this list if he and the New Radicals had just the one song? Well, that's because he's gone on to write songs for Santana and Enrique Iglesias and Jerry Hallwell and Rod Stewart and Kaiser Chiefs and The Struts and many others, sometimes under his own name, sometimes under a pseudonym. He's become a much-in-demand, big-money, mainstream songwriter. For the final person on this list, I'm going to cheat a little bit, because although he's not known for being a piano hero, he would not be where he is without piano lessons. When Trent Reznor's parents divorced when he was just six, he went to live with his grandparents. The family trauma led him to a couple of things. Skateboarding, 
building model trains, and playing the piano. Trent started on the piano when he was five and almost immediately showed an aptitude for the instrument. Classical music lessons followed, with his teacher focusing on what they called French parlor music, which meant Mozart, Bach, and Schumann. From there, Trent discovered Bartok, Debussy, and others. And even though he's moved through a number of other instruments, synths and guitars and even the tuba, he was the tuba player in the marching band at school, the basis for everything he's done and for what Nine Inch Nails has become is the piano. A big chunk of Nine Inch Nails tracks start as piano compositions because of his classical training. He's just more comfortable sitting at a piano than anywhere else. From the chord on the piano, he can hear what he wants to do with that sound. He often uses an old upright model to sample its sounds and then treat and manipulate them into something else. In fact, Trent developed a signature piano sound that he uses to this day in movie soundtracks that he composes. And even in the midst of all chaos and noise, a piano will suddenly appear. For example, let's go to 1994's The Downward Spiral. Piano sounds are all over this album, popping up when you least expect it, like in this song. Doesn't it make you feel better? The pigs have won tonight. They can all sleep soundly. And everything is all right. Given my complete lack of coordination between my hands and fingers, I am in awe of anyone who can sit down and just play. I once hosted an event with Chuck Liddell, one of the Rolling Stones' favorite pianists. Great guy. And when he sat down at the piano, his hands just came alive. He started playing all these intricate runs while carrying on a conversation. The fact that he might make a mistake and hit a bum note didn't even occur to him. I saw the same thing once before with Garth Hudson of the band. He was so frail, yet when his hands touched the keys, wow. And then there's Mike Garson, David Bowie's favorite piano player. Same thing. There are three more piano heroes in my books. While the electric guitar is the chief instrument of rock and roll, this music would have never happened had it not been for the acoustic piano. Songs that are ultimately performed and recorded using different instruments are often written on a standard piano. Let me give you a few more names. Andrew McMahon of band Something Corporate and Jack's Mannequin. Matt Bellamy of Muse, also known for his guitar work, but he's no slouch at the piano. If you want to catch up on other ongoing history shows, there are hundreds and hundreds of podcasts available. All you have to do is go to your favorite podcast platform and download whatever you'd like. They're all free. And you've got a standing invitation to my website, which is a journalofmusicalthings.com, which I update every day with music news and information. There's a free daily newsletter that goes with that. And then there's Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Email should go to alan at alancross.ca. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. We'll talk next time. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts.